a session on uh, unique resources for tribal communities. So we put together some information and we're not going to go deep on any of these programs. It's more of an overview, but hopefully uh, you'll be able to have some takeaways from this and be more enlightened on some of the resources available <clears throat> to tribes and to uh, native communities around the country. I'll first apologize. I, I've I'm I'm sitting here through a winter up in northern Illinois, so <clears throat> I think as I um, as I go along, I may have to mute my phone a couple of times just to clear my throat. So I hope it doesn't become uh, too much of an annoyance. Hold on, Russell. Give me one yes. minute. Um, so folks sure. are saying that they can't hear, so I'm trying to make sure. Okay. Let's see. I can hear you, but I don't know why. Let's see, let me unmute and see. Can you guys hear now? I can hear. I wonder I if just Jody's having a problem now. I can hear. At the beginning, you just hadn't put live audio yet. I can hear. Okay. Can you guys mute yourselves for me, please, as well? All right, thanks. Sorry. Me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. Right. All right, sorry about hmm. that, guys. Go ahead, um, Russell. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Just, uh, so, so let's get started. Um, so as I was mentioning, uh, Ray, Carey, Adrian, and I got together and uh, uh, wanted to put together a, a, a brief overview of, of capital resources for tribal housing, tribal communities. I thought I would start just with a little bit of background about our Native American program and enterprise. Some of you may know this, some of you uh, may not. Uh, in that enterprise, uh, created in 1982, of course, our Native programs uh, got put together in 1997. And we had a standalone program. It was based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And it really served the Pueblos uh, just in New Mexico. It was a small program. Uh, it was intended to do outreach, technical assistance, and help uh, Pueblos with their housing needs. Um, a lot of it had to do with home repairs and starting to dig into some of the programs we're going to talk about. Um, and um, so that was um, really our start uh, with a very specific program very specific uh, population, which of course has grown uh, to be a nationwide program now. Also back in the late 1990s, uh, there was a realization uh, in the credit community that the low income housing tax credit program, which is a very large production program, rehab program for multifamily housing was not being utilized by the tribes around the country. And that program was created in 1986. Uh, in the late 90s, very few allocations have been made to tribes. So Fannie Mae stepped in and uh, dedicated $25 million in a special fund just for tribes for them to, uh, for Fannie Mae to invest in tribal housing, rental housing, multifamily housing. And they picked a couple of a uh, couple of entities to work on that program. Raymond James uh, was one entity. Enterprise was the other. We did a lot of underwriting. Um, it was a successful program. The $25 million went out the door fairly quickly. And Fannie Mae created another $25 million fund, uh, an Indian country fund too, they called it, and uh, with the same players. And so during that period of time, from the late 90s going into 2002, 2003, Enterprise was involved in about 50 investments, 50 developments uh, in Indian country, um, small to larger ones, uh, about $100 million was invested and right around 1,000 units were created. Um, and so that was a real um, incentive for other investors to start looking at tribal housing. Once Fannie got in, and of course Fannie was a big player back then, 
uh, in buying. They had as much as 40% of the market. So other investors and banks and others looking at their program, figuring that uh, if they figure this out, how to invest on trust land and, and some of the other issues, sovereign immunity and other things that come up with tribes, uh, then we should take a look at it too. Uh, so it was very beneficial. And now you have a wide variety of investors that are investing in tribal housing. Um, in 2000, uh, the Rose Fellowship Program started, and in that first class, there was a Rose Fellow that was uh, uh, stationed at uh, OK Oinge Pueblo in New Mexico, Jamie Blosser. Many of you have heard her name or are familiar and know Jamie. Uh, she's still in Santa Fe, but she was in the original class, and uh, so that program uh, really started with uh, someone at a Pueblo and, and understanding their needs and conditions for housing. And since then, that program has put Rose Fellows at Santa Domingo Pueblo in New Mexico. It has also put uh, uh, a, a fellow at Pine Ridge in South Dakota. Uh, and Kaziah left there uh, in 2019 uh, or 2018. And then we have a current uh, Rose Fellow at Rosebud Reservation uh, in Mission, South Dakota. Uh, who's currently um, working on housing programs there. Uh, in 2003, uh, another significant investment was made by Enterprise in Indian Country, and that was on the White Earth Reservation in Minnesota. It was the first permanent supportive housing development uh, that had been done on a reservation. Permanent su supportive housing, many of you know, is housing that's created with uh, a heavy overlay of services, and uh, the, uh, the White Earth Tribe uh, set up a, a nonprofit and built 20 units of housing on the reservation uh, for uh, a very specific population. This was very successful. Uh, it's gone through uh, 15, 16 years now uh, of uh, permanency and programming. Uh, and they've gone on to do uh, several other tax credit developments. We invested about $3 million in that project and uh, they've gone on to do other projects, including more permanent supportive housing. In 2008, uh, the Native American program, <clears throat> there was some consolidation that went on with Enterprise, some reorganization. Of course, this was the beginning of the, the, the recession in 2008. And so the Native American program was merged with the rural program uh, and housed in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, where it was for a number of years until the director there retired. And then, uh, of course, the Rural Native American Initiative continues on today uh, in 2020 with programming and, um, and, and our work in Indian country. So, uh, Adrian, let's go to the next slide. Just take a brief look at the agenda for <coughs> the session. <coughs> So oh, the um, I wanted to talk about some of the bigger programs that uh, tribes are accessing, uh, and these are both in the areas of single-family housing, multi-family housing. Some of these programs can be used for both, and then just talk a little bit about uh, some of the other housing support that's out there and technical assistance uh, that's going on uh, across the country and who is involved in that. So let's go to the next slide, Adrian. And we'll first talk about the 184 program. The Section 184 program was uh, created in 1992. Uh, it was uh, very specific to um, tribal members and uh, tribes and TDHGs, tribally designated housing entities or housing authorities. Um, they're the only ones that can use this program. Uh, there was a lack of credit, uh, underserved uh, populations uh, on the reservations across the country. This program was intended to help solve those issues. Um, and since 1992, uh, about a little over $7 billion has been put into uh, mortgages and lending uh, across the country. Uh, you have to be a uh, federally recognized uh, tribe to access this program. And if you're an individual, you have to be an enrolled member of a tribe, federally recognized tribe. Uh, and that means different uh, enrollment procedures for different tribes, but uh, that's one of the criteria for this program. 
Uh, it does target single family mortgages um, and uh, it is an annual uh, appropriation for guaranteed authority uh, by Congress. So, and it is a nationwide program. So it does uh, cover uh, just about every area of the country. The next slide. So it's uh, primarily intended for uh, a, uh, a, a person's, a household's primary residence. It's not a program that can be used for second homes or investment properties. Um, and uh, again, uh, to, uh, available to all native communities. The next slide. So this uh, program can be used to purchase an existing home. Uh, you can build uh, a new home with it. You can uh, site build, uh, hire a contractor and build a home on site. Uh, you can also use it for modular housing. Uh, you can also use this program for manufactured homes on permanent foundations. Um, you can use it to rehabilitate an existing home, including putting in additional weatherization um, and energy uh, support. Uh, you can use it to purchase and rehab a home at the same time, or you can use the program to refinance uh, a mortgage that you have on a home, uh, particularly in uh, these days when mortgage rates are so low, uh, a lot of refinancing has been done uh, and allowing households to um, save a lot of money on their mortgages. The next slide. So if for a new homeowner, uh, again, to buy a home, build a new home, uh, and rehabilitate an existing home. If you're a current homeowner, you can refinance, uh, refinance and take cash out, uh, take out an equity piece from your home, or you can rehabilitate, put in a uh, new kitchen, uh, uh, upgrade homes, add bedrooms, uh, uh, things like that. So a very, very typical uh, mortgage type product in those regards as far as for a new homeowner or current homeowner. The next slide. So what is unique about this program, besides being available just to natives, is that um, it is a 100% guaranteed loan uh, through HUD. And so this gives lenders uh, a lot of comfort from the standpoint of being able to make loans in remote areas, on reservations, small communities, um, and uh, knowing that if there is a default, that there will be a payback with, through the guarantee. Uh, local lenders are involved in this process. Um, there are no income limits to this program. Uh, so like some of the other programs we'll talk about and some of the block grant funding for affordable housing that we're involved in both on uh, single family and on the rental side, uh, there are no income limits for this program. And you can uh, basically take out a loan um, in a lot of different areas. You don't have to be on a reservation or in a tribal community. Um, there are people that are using this loan program in uh, some of the urban areas across the country. The low down payment requirements, as you see on the slide, um, are 2.25%. Uh, it's been that way for a long time. I'm not sure why they have a split at 50,000 uh, as the breaking point for um, the reduction in the in the down payment. Uh, there is also a guaranteed fee. <coughs> Excuse me, a, a guarantee fee that's built in that can be built into the loan, and this helps reduce the cost of the program uh, and um, allows for the program to continue um, as it has since 1992. Um, if you have a loan that is loan to value of greater than 78%. There's also an add-on to your interest rate of the 0.25% uh, mortgage insurance premium um, that um, is included in your cost. One of the big pluses for this program uh, is that the loans are assumable. And I don't know of very many programs out there, if any, uh, where you're having loans that can be assumed by the next person that buys the house. Um, most loans are due on sale, uh, or if you refinance, you're basically getting whatever rate is out there in the, uh, in, in the environment today. So what makes this uh, unique is that there's been some strategies that some tribes have used. As I mentioned before, not only do individuals borrow under this program, but tribes can borrow under this program. Uh, an example would be the Oneida tribe in Wisconsin. Uh, they borrowed money under the 184 program to build 20 homes. Uh, 
Um, and at the same time, they were working with their uh, tribal members to get them credit ready uh, to be able to buy these homes from the tribe once they were fully constructed. <clears throat> so the strategy here was to take out the 184 loan while interest rates are low, knowing that when the homes are completed and they have qualified uh, members, that can assume these loans, they'll get the benefits of that low interest rate on these loans. Um, so it's a great feature, um, particularly in today's interest rate environment. The next slide, um, just an example of some of the loan limits that you'll see around the country. And uh, this $294,515, right down to the exact dollar amount, is uh, our loan amounts that are set by HUD under the programming. And I, I set that out as that's kind of the, the maximum around the country for rural areas, remote areas. I picked this one uh, out of uh, Rolette, North Dakota, near the Turtle Mountain Chippewa tribe. Uh, that's what their maximum loan amount is for a one unit uh, structure. Uh, you go to Chicago, Illinois, um, which you can make uh, 184 loans in the city. Uh, you go up much higher limits. And you'll see this, and there's charts that are available at HUD to show you what the loan limits are. Uh, even though they go up uh, significantly in bigger cities, it's still problematic on the, uh, on the West Coast, particularly where high, uh, high housing costs are, uh, are in, uh, in place. These do change yearly. They do make these adjustments, but uh, in some cases, they, they still cause will cause a problem. The next slide, uh, just on some of the housing challenges, program challenges for the 184. Um, the 184 actually is uh, being looked at right now um, as far as changes. They've gone out for public comment, comment and consultation with the tribes and have gotten a lot of input from the lenders that are involved in this program. Uh, there's probably over 150 lenders across the country uh, that can uh, make loans under this program. Um, <clears throat> and, and they've all started to submit comments on improving this program. Um, and uh, they're interested in trying to expand the program because even though um, there's been a significant amount of loans made across the country, they are still not utilizing the full guarantee authority that this program has. So in other words, uh, Congress every year has to uh, appropriate guarantee authority for this program. Um, the lenders will make the loan. They will sell off the guarantee in the secondary market for liquidity and keep making more loans. Um, and this program can make as many loans in a particular year all the way up to the limits of the guarantee authority um, that's uh, issued by Congress. But they've never gotten to that authority limit in fact, well below it. So, um, so there's, there's a lot of room for more loans that can be made. Uh, we talked a little bit in a previous slide about the low down payment requirements. Um, even though they are low, uh, for many uh, households, they're still hard to make. Uh, you're looking at um, a, uh, a savings, basically, that you have to come up with um, to be able to, to make that down payment. 93% uh, of the Section 184 home loans are made on fee simple land. Uh, so only 7% are made on tribal trust land. When the program was created in 1992, one of the efforts for the program uh, in initiating the program was to have more mortgages, more loans made on trust land. And that simply hasn't uh, come about. Um, there's an effort going on now for more lending on trust land. Um, but the majority of these uh, loans are still made on fee simple land where people are paying taxes and, uh, and it's not a leasehold interest. Um, the program also could use more lenders, even though there might be over 150 lenders that are all not active. I put down three lenders here that are quite active. Um, and First Tribal, as an example, has an office in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Uh, a lot of the folks at First Tribal, which is owned by Mid-American Mortgage, um, came from the old Wells Fargo system. Wells Fargo pulled out of the 184 program. They had a 
large program for many years, but um, they decided not to continue in that. So a lot of the folks at First Tribal came out of that program and they are a great resource. They have a great website. In fact, they have uh, four specific videos that talk about the 184 program on loan uh, frequently asked questions, on credit requirements, on construction loans, and on making loans on tribal trust land. So those are all uh, available on their website and, and very helpful short videos to give you some more information about the 184 and how they look at it. Uh, bank two, I, I just realized after doing this uh, slide that uh, Bank two has changed their name to the Chickasaw Community Bank. And this is a tribally owned bank in Oklahoma. Uh, they're based in Oklahoma City, but they do a large volume of 184 activity, not only in Oklahoma, but other parts of the country. Uh, Bay Bank is a tribally owned bank in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, they're owned by the Oneida tribe, and they have a significant presence in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois uh, is their service territory. So some of these banks are national in their scope. Others like Bay Bank are more regional um, and they will tell you um, uh, on their website and, and tell you up front uh, where their uh, lending territory happens to be. Uh, the other guaranteed program, and I'll just touch on it briefly because it's being used, uh, trying to be used more and more, but it is a guarantee authority uh, from HUD is called Title VI. And Title VI is a way for a tribe, a TDHA Tribal Housing Authority, to take their uh, Indian Housing Block Grant dollars, their Nahasa dollars, and we'll talk about that in a minute, and being able to leverage those dollars into a loan. Um, and to be able to um, help with infrastructure and to build homes um, in their communities. And it's been used uh, in a number of communities. Um, it's really you know, taking your future, current and future payments that you're going to be receiving under block grant and just leveraging them into a loan so you can do something now rather than um, maybe taking smaller amounts of money and, and, and having to do less over the next uh, five years or so. So the next slide just shows a few of the uh, resources that are out there, um, and uh, these are all accessible via the uh, internet and the web. Um, one that I'll point out, uh, the Tribal Leaders Handbook on Home Ownership was a, a publication both online and in print that was put out by the Center for Indian Country Development, uh, Minneapolis Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, they started the center in 2015. And early on in that process, they actually uh, looked at the uh, handbook that we had done at Enterprise for tribal housing in New Mexico. Uh, that original handbook was done in 2003 uh, by our original staff in New Mexico. And of course, much of the information had become outdated. So we made an effort in 2016 to update that handbook. And we worked with a housing finance agency in New Mexico uh, that's very active there and with some other partners and uh, put that, uh, that information together in the handbook. Uh, they liked that idea at the Center for Indian Country Development, so they expanded that into a national resource that's out there and, uh, and again, available to anyone that wants to access it. Uh, and we have copies also at Enterprise uh, if you want a hard copy. And then just some of the other information that's out there, uh, different resource guides um, that are available if people are wanting to dig into more of the Section 184 program. So the next slide, uh, we're gonna talk about the Indian Housing Block Grant Program. And uh, many times you'll hear the uh, reference to the HASDA, the Native American Housing and Self-Determination Act. NAHASDA is the acronym. This program was created in uh, 1996, the block grant program. And it was created so that tribes would have more control and more choices on how to use their housing funds. Um, there's two pieces in NAHASDA. There's a formula piece, a uh, formula allocation, which goes to all federally recognized tribes across the country and then there are uh, competitive allocations, and we'll talk about those in a minute. There were 
52 of those that were awarded in 2019. So the formula allocations, if you're a federally recognized tribe and there's uh, 567, if not more, federally recognized tribes uh, that uh, access these funds, uh, the next slide just talks a little bit about uh, what goes into uh, this formula for funding. They look at the need, look at the population, the income bands um, at, uh, in a particular community or reservation, and then the housing conditions. So in this fiscal year, 2020, um, and there was just something that was out on the Enterprise uh, Housing Digest last night, I noticed uh, from HUD announcing that they'd released all these funds. Uh, but the funding was about uh, just under $650 million. Uh, but again, this is uh, funds for all of the tribes across the country. Um, so, and we'll take a look at a chart in a minute to show some of the disparities in the funding. So these are fairly flexible funds. You can use them for single family housing. You can use them for multifamily housing, rentals. Uh, you can use them for loans. Um, you can use it for rental assistance on a rental project. And sometimes these funds are built into a, a leveraged uh, multifamily development with tax credits, as an example, uh, using uh, NAHASDA funds to fill gaps or for rental assistance uh, on the units themselves for tribal members. Um, you can rehab existing units and you can use it for uh, the administration of the program. Um, so the tribes typically determine uh, how they want to use their funds. They have an Indian housing plan, typically a two-year plan that gets submitted to HUD. Uh, the grant administration for this program typically goes through the Office of Native American Programs. And they have six uh, large offices uh, around the country uh, that handle um, uh, the, the, the grant administration for particular regions. And I listed the areas there um, Chicago probably has the biggest area, but the fewest uh, tribes, uh, they cover everything east of the Mississippi, uh, including, uh, and they also take care of Minnesota and Iowa. Uh, and then as you go further west, uh, more tribes, uh, more activity, um, certainly more uh, grant administration. So the next slide um, just gives you an example of um, the allocation that goes to some tribes. Um, and all tribes obviously aren't the same. They're geographically different, uh, culturally different, uh, and the size of the tribes, obviously, both from uh, the tribal members that are in the service area, which is taken into account. Tribes do normally have to uh, designate a service area where a substantial number of their members live. It could be on the reservation or nearby communities and such. And then they'll also take a look at the enrollment, enrolled members of the tribe who may not be living on that reservation. They could be anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, actually. Um, and then uh, the allocations are made based on a formula. So as an example, we've done work with uh, Lakota Sioux and in Pine Ridge, and they get uh, almost $11 million. Uh, of NAHASDA funding per year. Um, the NAHASDA funding, unfortunately, for the last 10 years or so, has basically been flatlined with the federal budget. So this $650 million of NAHASDA funding uh, has not changed much. And as we all know, with costs going up, construction costs, administrative costs, wages and such, um, you end up with the same amount of dollars, but really getting less uh, from the program. Uh, at Pine Ridge, they use a lot of their dollars for rehabbing existing units. The Housing Authority at Pine Ridge manages, I believe, almost 1,300 units on the reservation. And so they have a, a large staff that does rehab on, on turnovers and rental units there, uh, not a whole lot that's going into new construction. Uh, Navajo, very large area, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, uh, very large enrollment, uh, very large allocation, but again, lots of communities, lots of people to serve. Um, then we get to, you know, some, uh, uh, some very small tribes and some tribes that um, are um, just maybe in many cases 200, 300 members, if not less, 
And the minimum allocation seems to be around this $47,000 or so. And as I've talked to some of the uh, tribal communities in California has a number of these, um, they really can't do much with $47,000. They contract out maybe for an administrator. Uh, they do some repair type loans, grants and such, but um, uh, they're really uh, challenged by the small amount that they get. Uh, Red Cliff Chippewa, a uh, tribe in northern Wisconsin on Lake Superior, uh, about a million dollars. Uh, we worked with them on home ownership. Tohono O'odham is in Arizona, uh, two million acres reservation on uh, uniquely both sides of the border in Mexico and in uh, Arizona. Uh, very spread out, uh, large enrollment, but uh, again, just about four million dollars for uh, their Nahazka formula driven. Now the next slide, um, just on the competitive uh, side of the Indian Housing Block Grant, um, 52 awards uh, in 2019, $200 million. Uh, and I just used this example of Redcliffe. Um, they put together a package where previously we looked at Redcliffe having a formula allocation of just over a million dollars for their program. Well, they also applied under the competitive side of the Indian Housing Block Grant. So they put together a program for their housing and uh, were awarded an additional almost $5 million. Um, so um, I put on here, grant writers are a key. They're a big part of uh, putting together a competitive application um, and it is very competitive. And so um, congratulations to those that uh, were able to get through that process and get additional money. The next slide, um, just a bit about the Indian Community Development Block Grant Program. Uh, many of you heard, have probably heard with communities across the country, the Community Development Block Grant Program. Uh, many communities use this for streets, water, sewer, uh, some basic infrastructure. There is an Indian CDBG also, again, competitive, typically one cycle a year, and those funds can be used for housing. Uh, but many other things, including uh, community buildings and some economic development. Not as much money as the, the block grant program, 63 million, 85 tribes in 2019. Um, and that uh, is probably, I would say, looking at the list that were awarded, probably 400,000 seemed to be, $500,000 seemed to be kind of the average, kind of the sweet spot for um, some of those awards that happened. Uh, the next slide uh, just talks about infrastructure, which is um, a big issue, particularly on the reservations and where we work uh, in really trying to put together a housing program, uh, trying to put together uh, water, sewer, energy, roads, where do those dollars come from? Very expensive, uh, put together a subdivision um, I know working with Cheyenne River over the years, their limiting factor was water for many, many years. They could not do anything until they got more water, a new water tower. They finally did. They were able to put in infrastructure for a 200 unit subdivision, and now they're doing lots of housing at Cheyenne River um, under the, uh, the housing authority and with others. So the very important uh, programs, but they're a bit scattered uh, in that uh, there's different pieces uh, in different programs and putting all these together, but that uh, seems to be the way it is these days. Uh, the USDA has a set aside for tribes uh, for their water and sewer programs. It's called the 306C program. Uh, those funds are always used, used um, highly competitive. Uh, they do uh, tend to put the funds uh, in underserved and impoverished areas first. Uh, it's very heavy on the grant side and uh, a little bit of loan thrown in for that program. Uh, the Department of Commerce, the federal government has a EDA, Economic Development, um, that does um, grants uh, to uh, tribal communities. Uh, I saw one of these used at Rosebud in Mission, South Dakota, where they're studying um, the uh, land between their grocery store and going back to town where it's open land, they wanna put in some additional commercial businesses, and that grant uh, helped with uh, doing a feasibility study on uh, water sewer connections and, 
and how they would need to lay that out. Uh, tribal energy programs have gotten a lot of attention, uh, and there are specific companies and the specific law firms out there uh, that are pushing the tribal energy programs. Uh, work very well. Uh, Picaris in uh, New Mexico put in some tribal, uh, had a tribal energy program. They got a million dollars uh, grant for their um, for their program. A uh, very small community in northern New Mexico. Indian Health Services falls under Health and Human Services, and they get involved in some infrastructure issues, as does the Bureau of Indian Affairs, uh, Department of Interior. Uh, you go to some reservations, the roads are Bureau of Indian Affairs roads, uh, but much of the other infrastructure is also. And then, of course, we talked about in Hazda, the Section 184, the Indian Housing Block Grant Program under HUD. Uh, and then I'll mention just briefly, uh, Veterans Administration does have a Native Homeownership Direct Program just for Native Americans. The Veterans Administration, of course, has a housing program for all veterans. It's a guaranteed program also. But this program is a direct home ownership. They make the loans directly to uh, Native Americans for homes. It's a small program. Not many people know about it, but uh, hopefully it's starting to pick up with some activity um, across the country. The Veterans Administration also has uh, worked with HUD in issuing what are called VASH vouchers, Veterans Administration Supportive Housing Vouchers. Uh, initially, when VASH vouchers came out from uh, VA and through HUD, uh, tribes weren't eligible uh, to receive VASH vouchers. Um, they went back in and uh, there were some changes made and they have come out with a demonstration project now to issue VASH vouchers, and about 25 tribes received VASH vouchers two or three years ago. VASH vouchers basically allow, <clears throat> uh, just like any other voucher, uh, for new housing um, and for veterans, it uh, helps them pay, um, uh, they only be paying 30% of their income towards rent, whatever that happens to be. And then if you have at least 20 VASH vouchers, you also get a service coordinator that comes with those. Uh, unfortunately, the VASH voucher program, after the initial push of money, has uh, just only a million dollars set aside uh, for tribal VASH in the 2020 budget. Um, so that's uh, something hopefully that can be improved on. It's a, it's a good program where it can be used. Uh, the next slide, uh, just wanted to uh, start wrapping up a little bit about some of the housing support uh, that's out there and some of the organizations that are working both uh, nationally and in some cases on a regional basis. The National American Indian Housing Council is um, involved in housing in every which way. Uh, they're representing well over 250, almost 300 housing authorities, TDHEs around the country. They have a legislative session in Washington, D.C. in the spring. They have a typically a annual conference in May or June. This year it's in Seattle. Uh, we'll have people there and we typically have made presentations and work with them closely. Um, and then they'll have a, uh, a third conference typically in December. It's more of a, a legal forum talking about legal issues, housing issues and such uh, held in Las Vegas every year. Um, they have eight regional housing, uh, tribal housing associations that kind of feed up uh, issues and, um, and, and different programming uh, issues to NAIHC. Uh, and they're able then to, at NAIHC, be able to uh, represent um, the country in these regional issues uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, they're providing adv advocacy, obviously, uh, training and conferences um, that are pretty well attended. Uh, they're a membership organization and Enterprise is an affiliate member uh, of that organization. <clears throat> the next slide um, talks about uh, kind of a broader organization, the National Congress of American Indians. They were established in 1944 and they cover lots of issues uh, on Indian affairs, but housing has become a priority uh, with them and it has been elevated. Uh, to be uh, much more in their discussions. Uh, 
uh, that take place now, which is great to see. I also mentioned uh, just on the housing support that you're seeing a lot of uh, CDFIs, tribal C CDFIs, uh, community development financial institutions that have been created. Um, there's CDFIs all across the country. There's probably, oh, probably 70 to 80 maybe that are tribal CDFIs. They're not all involved in housing. A lot of them do business lending, uh, but we're starting to see CDFIs take on that housing role particularly in South Dakota, um, at Pine Ridge and at Cheyenne River. Uh, they have a pilot project on single-family housing lending with the USDA using one of their loan products uh, to be able to make loans through the CDFI to tribal members. Um, and I think that program has uh, gotten off to a good start. Uh, hopefully, they'll be picked up by other states, and USDA will, uh, will help them get their money out the door um, with tribal communities. So the next slide, just a little bit about technical assistance and where some of that is coming from. The uh, Office of Native American Programs, the ONAP offices that I mentioned before, uh, do training um, and uh, through their offices, through their grant uh, supervision. Um, the Center for Indian Country Development, I mentioned before at the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis, um, has done a lot of training. They put out a lot of publications. They've been mainly a research center for a lot of these issues, but uh, they have been a good source of reliable information, and that program will continue. Uh, the original director, Patrice Kunish, left uh, recently. She was a great advocate uh, and a great supporter of tribal housing, but they have a new director now, and so that program, uh, I'm glad to see, is, will continue. The Native Learning Center is a, a very specific center in Hollywood, Florida. It uh, was established by the Seminole Tribe. They do webinars and they do conferences and they do trainings around the country, but a lot of it is done online. Uh, they have been in existence for almost 10 years, I believe, and we've done some trainings through them, uh, some webinars through them also. But again, another good resource uh, for tribes to uh, take advantage of. And then, of course, I listed ourselves, Enterprise Community Partners, through our Section 4 programming, our trainings in single-family housing, multifamily housing. We've done a lot of trainings in permanent supportive housing. Um, and then uh, the establishment of the Sustainable Native Communities Collaborative, which many of you were familiar with, if you know Joseph Kunkel and uh, that group that got started. They've been kind of absorbed now into mass design, uh, but still doing lots of tribal work and uh, design issues with tribes across the, uh, across the country uh, and do great work. So uh, just the next slide in summary, um, there's pools of funding uh, across multiple federal agencies and for most tribes, uh, they need someone to you know, kind of constantly look at these pools of funding and whether it applies to them or not. Uh, and it can be a burden for, for them from the standpoint of applying for grants and keeping them straight, uh, a grant writer at, at the tribal level, whether it be for the tribe or for the housing authority, uh, and going after the, these dollars um, is an important position to have. And the good ones are uh, in demand. Uh, state resources are a bit varied and I would say minimal for tribes. Um, we do see some uh, states step up through their Indian Affairs Department if they have one um, and put resources into housing and reservations. An example in Colorado is the Ute Mountain Ute, uh, which is a very remote tribe, uh, poor tribe they were able to access $2 million grant from the state of Colorado. The first time that Colorado, the state of Colorado, had ever made a grant to a tribe. And so they were able to use that for some permanent supportive housing units uh, that they got built uh, out in the far western edge of, uh, of Colorado. Uh, th there's obviously a huge unmet need in housing. We all know that um, the poverty issues are there, employment issues, the remoteness of some of these areas. Uh, another um, area of concern uh, is high turnover in some of the professional positions. Uh, we found that working with uh, high capacity housing authorities, they've gotten to that 
bigger capacity because they have people that have uh, stayed in place and have done the same job for a number of years. And there's that continuity of programming and with people and some of their master planning that goes on uh, and really having a good uh, framework of what they want to do. And then, as I mentioned, also just uh, good grant writers are golden. So next slide, just to, to me, I, I'm always optimistic from the standpoint of uh, the future. And I think it looks brighter for tribal housing. Uh, more tribes are doing master planning for housing, which is great to see. Uh, more tribes are using leverage, uh, taking the dollars that they get, whether it Nahasda dollars or being able to take the $184 or some of these other programs for infrastructure and really leveraging them with other housing programs, whether it be low-income housing tax credits, other partnerships, um, you, you leveraging it with their CDFIs. You're seeing more nonprofits being created, tribal nonprofits, and you're seeing more tribal uh, community development corporations um, also being set up that can access different funds that a tribal housing authority may not be able to access. I, I certainly see more community engagement going on. Um, I think the successful ones are getting things done, uh, less top-down type strategies where everything has to come from tribal council. Um, that's not the case in, in many communities anymore. Uh, there's certainly more interest in native issues, particularly on housing, health, and education. Uh, but I think as we all know, there's no quick fixes, but just a, a continued sustained effort um, on all of these programs. So with that, um, that's uh, what I wanted to cover on the capital resources, and I'll leave it open, Adrian, for questions, comments, discussion, and really as we left it with Ray and Carrie when we started talking about this, this was kind of an overview, and we really wanted to come back to people that were listening or uh, take a look at the recording of this, and if they have other issues or want to get into any of these programs a bit more, or even what Enterprise is doing specifically, we'd be glad to do that at a later date. So thanks again, and I'll leave it to you, Adrian, to field any questions. All right, thank you, Russell. Um, if anyone has any questions, just unmute your phones, and we would gladly answer. This is Carrie. I was just curious. Um, we talked to, in our meeting about trying to increase tribes' usage of light tech funding, and I was just curious what barriers, like, would they access like the state with that they're within, like, light tech allocation, or is there a separate light tech allocation for tribal communities, or how might that work? Yeah, good question, Kerry. Um, <clears throat> there are different approaches by states on LIHTC, and um, an example would be uh, North Dakota has 10% of their tax credits set aside for tribes every year. Uh, the state of Arizona sets aside tax credits for tribes, and they can usually fund one or two projects per year. Um, is the state of California set aside about four or five years ago. Uh, out of their rural set aside of $20 million of tax credits, they sliced off $1 million just for tribes. So in those set asides, tribes are competing against tribes. Uh, and they're not competing against the bigger pool of for-profit, non-profit developers in those states. Uh, other states have approached it differently where they are uh, providing some incentives through point scoring. Uh, but those are the only states that have done a true set aside um, the other limiting factor is getting a good consultant. As we all know, LIHTC is pretty, um, pretty comprehensive, pretty difficult um, to understand and put together a competitive application. So there's only a handful of consultants out there that do this with tribes. Um, and so we know typically who they are and who the good ones are and who the ones are to avoid. So. Uh, when asked, we provide that, and we're always looking for, you know, additional uh, organizations that want to do more work in this area. Um, so uh, it's um, it, it's 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 a uh, continuing process of looking for more um, good consultants. Thank you.
Any more questions? Okay, I guess Carrie was the only person who had questions. Um, Russell, do you have anything else to add? No, I don't. I, I again just offer that anybody on our team, uh, you know, be happy to talk about our our programming um, on the Rural Native American Initiative. Um, I think this is an important piece of enterprise. I'm glad that. It's being supported overall by Enterprise. Uh, I'm glad you attend, uh, attended today to learn a little bit more about some of these unique resources. Um, they're a bit hard to understand sometimes and, uh, and how they fit in, but uh, I think they do need to be used. Uh, they can expand uh, housing uh, across Indian country. So thanks for attending. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. Sure.